Hi everyone, welcome back. How are you all doing? I hope you've all had a good week. So today we're actually going to Brazil and we haven't been to Brazil for a very long time. We've only been to Brazil once before and that is when I covered the case of Pedro Rodriguez Filho, which was over a year ago now. And I really am trying to cover different cases from different countries, not just the US and the UK. And today we are going to be looking at another one of Brazil's most infamous murders. And that is the case of Suzanne Von Richthofen. Now, the best way to describe Suzanne is entitled. She was incredibly privileged. She came from a very wealthy family. She was literally handed everything on a silver platter. And then one day, 16-year-old Suzanne got a boyfriend called Daniel, and this changed everything. Her whole personality just kind of changed. But the question is, is Suzanne the bad influence or is the new boyfriend, Daniel, the bad influence? But either way, Suzanne decided that everything that her parents had given her in life, the privilege that she had, wasn't enough. Certain decisions that her parents made she wasn't happy with them and she wanted to take revenge and it all ended in tragedy. So that is what we are going to be getting into today. So let's jump in. I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Home Design Makeover. Home Design Makeover is a free to download match three puzzle game where you play as a home renovator. And the aim of the game is to solve puzzles, earn money and decorate and remodel fixer uppers into the perfect dream home. Now you guys know I love a good mobile game and this game is no exception. It is just so relaxing and unwinding decorating to make these perfect rooms and the game has such a realistic feel and I recently designed this outdoor brunch dining area and I'm so proud of it. It's so cute. I actually love it. It really does feel like I designed that, like I'm actually a home renovator and the match three games are challenging but not too challenging so it keeps your brain engaged. And on top of all of that, there is also a storyline running through this of a will they, won't they between your home design assistants, Troy and Julia. And I'm kind of curious to see where that storyline goes. Personally, I feel like they're going to get together. And one of the main things I love about this game is the flexibility. Now I'm a Libran, okay? And I I'm a little bit stereotypical Libra because I can never decide anything. Like for example, I am currently working on this kitchen and right now it's pretty gray. This actually kind of looks like my real kitchen. When I first started designing this kitchen, I was actually going for this kind of like taupey brown kind of color. And I actually really do like this color. But when all of it was this taupey gray kind of color, I was thinking, I don't know whether I like that. I don't know. I don't know. So I changed it back to gray. But that is the good thing about this game is that you can change your mind. And if you wanted to check out Home Design Makeover for yourself, you can download the game by going to the link in my description box or by scanning the QR code that is on your screen right now. And by downloading the game through that link in my description box, rather than going to the app store really does help out this channel. And I'm currently on level 42 and I am kind of stuck on this level. So if you guys download this game, you'll have to let me know if you can get past level 42. I'm actually just playing right now. No, I'm out of moves. Didn't get past it. Oh my God, I'm going to be stuck on this level for so long. Oh, and if you also want to unlock some rewards in the game, you can use my referral code, which is DK8, which is on the screen right now. Thank you again to Home Design for sponsoring this video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Suzanne von Richthofen was born on the 3rd of November, 1983, making her a Scorpio. She grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where she lived with her family. Now, like I said in the intro, if there is one thing that you need to know about Suzanne and her family is they had a lot of money and I'm talking a lot of money. Her parents, Manfred and Mauricia, they met back in the 70s when they were both attending the University of Sao Paulo. They lived in Germany for some time because Manfred was of German descent. They settled down, they got married, and then they both went on to have very successful careers. Manfred started work as an engineering director for a very large company in Sao Paulo, and he made a lot 
of money from this. And Mauricia became a psychiatrist and ran her own private practice. And she became one of the most respectable psychiatrists in Sao Paulo. So they are both equally successful. They both earn an equal amount of a lot of money. And then following this, the couple went on to have two children, one of them being Suzanne, who was the oldest, and then a younger son called Andreas, who was four years younger. Oh, and side note, because I kind of found this interesting, but as well as the family being very wealthy, Manfred claimed to be the great nephew of a very famous German fighter pilot from World War I, who also went by the name Manfred von Richthofen, but he was most commonly known as the Red Baron. And according to my research, the Red Baron was one of the most feared and respected fighter pilots from World War I, shooting down a total of 80 planes, which was the record for any fighter pilot in World War I. So that was kind of a claim to fame for Suzanne's family that they were related to this fighter pilot. Sorry for a little bit of a history lesson there. I know my dad will enjoy that because my dad was in the army and he loves all stuff like that. Anyway, back to Suzanne's childhood. The fact that her family, her parents were so wealthy really did define her childhood because she was very privileged. She had access to a lot of things that the majority of the people all around the world do not have access to. The family lived in a pretty fancy, huge mansion, which was worth approximately $600,000. And you've got to bear in mind as well that that was like back in the 90s. So I don't actually know how much that house would be worth today. And they lived in a very wealthy neighborhood of Campo Bello. And there are pictures of this house and it is fancy. They have a pool. They have like personal offices for both Manfred and Mauricia. They even have a library. They even have staff at this house. So that pretty much tells you how wealthy they are, that they have staff. It is said that the family were worth approximately 17 million dollars. Yeah, I was not joking when I said that this family were wealthy. It is also rumored as well that Manfred had tens of millions of dollars in offshore accounts. So the actual wealth of the family is not known, but all you need to know is that they are multi-millionaires. And because they did have so much money, Suzanne and her brother Andreas pretty much got whatever they wanted. They got the best education that money could buy. They went to private schools. So both Suzanne Suzanne and Andreas were sent to a private school called Humboldt, which was a German school in Sao Paulo. It was also known to be one of the best in the city, but do you expect anything less from this family? Suzanne also learned to speak four languages, which is like bloody hell. I'm always so jealous of people that can speak multiple languages, but Suzanne knew how to speak German, Portuguese, obviously, and Spanish and English. And Suzanne did get good grades. She was a really good student. She did extra activities. She was pretty much a model student. And so was her little brother. Suzanne was also known to be a pretty shy girl, quite reserved at times. And it's said that Suzanne's parents were kind of the same. They just kept to themselves. They preferred quiet nights in. They preferred quiet nights in with the family. They did have quite a few family nights. They were really close as a family. From somebody on the outside looking in, they would look like the perfect family. So something that is probably no surprise given how much money this family have, but Suzanne got a pretty big allowance. And Suzanne, with her quite large group of friends, Suzanne would like to spend her money on her friends and treat her friends. And they would go out and they would have food. They would go to the mall. And money seems to be very important to Suzanne. Um, which is going to become pretty obvious later down the line. So now we get to August of 1999. Suzanne is now 15 years old. And on a Sunday afternoon, Suzanne, her parents and her younger brother head down to the local park. Now, Andreas, who was also quite a shy, quite a quiet boy, he got on really well with the household staff and he didn't really have too many friends of his own. He would spend most of his time just in his room on his computer. But there was one thing that he loved more than anything else, and that was model airplanes. So on that Sunday afternoon, the whole family headed down to the local park and something pretty significant happened when the family went to this park because the family met 18 year old Daniel Crovinos. And this chance meeting would have a significant 
impact on the whole family. So Daniel Corvinos was born on the 26th of January 1981, making him an Aquarius. And he grew up in Sao Paulo with his parents and then his older brother, Christian. Now, Daniel's background was pretty much the complete opposite to Suzanne's. Daniel came from a pretty poor family. They didn't have a lot of money. They did struggle to get by. He definitely did not have the opportunities that Suzanne had in life. However, there was one thing that he loved like Andreas, and that was model planes. But this was not just a hobby for Daniel. This was actually a sport. He competed in competitions and he was very good at it because Daniel became the Sao Paulo champion, the Brazilian champion. And then he entered into a global competition and he came fifth. Daniel was literally one of the best in the world. However, being one of the best in the world for flying model airplanes didn't really pay that well. It was not like he was living the high life. And right now, Daniel had just finished school and he was struggling to get by. He was currently working as a tutor for flying model airplanes. And it was on that day in August of 1999 that Suzanne and her whole family went to the park because Andreas was taking lessons from Daniel. And as soon as Daniel met Suzanne, it was like he instantly fell for her. Suzanne caught his eye straight away. And pretty much from that very first meeting, Daniel decided that he wanted Suzanne to be his girlfriend. However, the same could not be said for Suzanne. Mm -mm, she was not interested in Daniel straight away. Suzanne actually started to like one of the other instructors. And Suzanne was actually trying to pursue this other instructor for five months. And Daniel just had to watch from the sidelines, filling with jealousy. However, when Suzanne finally plucked up the courage to go over to that other instructor, let them know that she was interested, that other instructor flat out turned her down. And this is when Daniel saw his chance. Because upon receiving this rejection, Daniel seemed to finally catch Suzanne's eye. And then it pretty much went the same way as any other teenage love story. It soon blossomed. It was pretty intense very quickly. Suzanne was completely swept off her feet by Daniel. And this was Suzanne's very first boyfriend. Suzanne was currently 16 years old when they finally got into a relationship and Daniel was 18. And because Daniel had been teaching Andreas for over five months now, flying model airplanes, Suzanne's parents, Manfred and Mauricia, they didn't really think too much of the relationship because they knew Daniel. Daniel was a good kid. However, their relationship carries on for about a year and it's all great. And it's all like a perfect little teenage love story. But would it last like that? Oh no, of course it wasn't. So now we get to 2001. Suzanne is now 17 and Daniel is 19. And this is when things start to go south because it is now when Daniel becomes a bad influence on Suzanne. So first of all, Suzanne is spending a lot of time at Daniel's house and he comes from a completely different world to Suzanne. At Suzanne's house, everything was quite calm, quite peaceful, very organized. Suzanne was expected to focus on her schoolwork. They would sit at the dining table to have dinner. They would have polite, intelligent discussions discussions. The kids were also expected to follow a pretty strict schedule. Like for example, every single meal time, there was an exact time that that meal would happen. The children were also expected to wake up at a strict time every single day. And they were never allowed to just lounge around the house and watch TV. But it was the complete opposite at Daniel's house. Daniel could do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and there was never any consequences. And Daniel had an older brother who was 25 year old Christian, and the two brothers would literally just do whatever they wanted. And they did become a bit of a nightmare in the neighborhood. There would always be really loud, wild parties. There would be music blaring literally 24 seven. The two brothers would always be smoking weed and they were just really disrespectful and rude to the neighbors. So the neighbors would complain, but Daniel's parents, they would never discipline their children. They just learned that there was never any consequences to their actions. And there is one story which 
Oh God, it's disgusting. So Daniel's family had a dog and I don't know why they did this. This is just so annoying. And I would get annoyed if this happened to me. So when Daniel and Christian would walk the dog, they would let their dog poop on the neighbor's garden and not clean it up. And this actually happened to me before. It wasn't a neighbor's dog though, but there was dog poop on my front garden. And I was just like, are you being serious? It's just so disrespectful, isn't it? It's like, if your dog poops, that's fine. Pick it up though. And Daniel and Christian, they just let their dog poop everywhere all over the neighborhood and they wouldn't clean it up. And the neighbors understandably got really frustrated with this. So one of the neighbors picked up the dog poop and threw it over the fence into Daniel's property. And Daniel and Christian, they were not happy about this, oh no. In response to this, because they were thinking, how dare a neighbor throw our own dog's poop back into our property? How dare they do that? So Daniel and Christian got the dog poop and smeared it over the neighbor's car. It's like, Oh my God, that's disgusting. And I definitely wouldn't want people like that as neighbors. And apparently no one else wanted them as neighbors either. There was actually elderly residents in the area that just started moving because they didn't want to live near this family. And that's how bad this family were. They were literally just a nightmare. Can you believe that they are literally driving people out of their own home? So hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of the Cruvignos household. And this is the kind of environment that Suzanne was in a lot of the time. And Suzanne actually thrived and loved this chaos. She felt like she was being stifled by her parents' strict rules and she loved that there was no rules at Daniel's house. But did the bad influence stop there? No, of course it didn't. Because there was something else that would soon become a problem and that was drugs. Because you see the 25 year old brother Christian, he was a pretty heavy drug user. So much so that he'd actually built up a massive debt with a local dealer, which is obviously not a good situation to be in. And he also went to rehab several times for his cocaine addiction. But did going to rehab or anything like that, the fact that he was in debt, did it stop his drug addiction? No, of course it didn't. Christian carried on buying drugs because he was addicted, but then he started passing these drugs on to Daniel and Suzanne. So it started off with just a little bit of weed here and there, but then it did graduate to harder, heavier drugs. It was escalating and escalating until Suzanne was taking Thinking drugs like ecstasy and cocaine on a regular basis. It's bad enough that Suzanne was getting involved in this and doing drugs, these hard drugs, but she also started to get her younger brother, Andreas, involved. Andreas is only 13 at this point. Why is Suzanne sucking him into this world? They were encouraging Andreas to hang out with them and then they started introducing him to the same drugs that they were taking. And Andreas, like I said, he didn't have many friends of his own. He already looked up to Daniel because Daniel was this basically world champion of flying model airplanes. Andreas is not going to say no to hanging out with these cool older people. And when these cool older people are offering him drugs, he is going to say yes, which is exactly what he did. Andreas was now also loving this completely different lifestyle. He was loving the freedom that Daniel's world was giving him. It got to a point where Andreas was actually breaking out of his bedroom window, breaking curfew to go joyriding with Daniel. And they would stay out to like four in the morning. And he's 13. I feel like I need to stress that again. He's 13. And his parents had no idea what he was getting up to. They had no idea that he was breaking out of the house. And Daniel, he's a bad character. He is. They were messing with the wrong people and Daniel would sometimes have a gun on him and these things can escalate so quickly sometimes. And I just hate that Andreas is being involved in this world. And at this point, Suzanne and Andreas's parents are completely oblivious to all of this. So now we get to late 2001. Suzanne has just turned 18 and Daniel is about to turn 21. And this is when Suzanne Anne has graduated from high school and is about to attend university. And Suzanne was planning on studying for a law degree. Her parents had all of these plans that she was going to go to the best law school because obviously they can afford it. But sadly, because of all of the distraction from Daniel, Suzanne didn't get the grades. So Suzanne was left to go to her second choice of university, which was still a good school, you know, but it just wasn't the best law 
law school in the city. And Suzanne's parents were devastated that she never got the grades to get into that really good law school because they had really high hopes for her. I mean, Suzanne was getting good grades. She had a bright future ahead of her. And her parents were so worried, they actually made Andreas switch schools to make sure that he got the grades. Because clearly at this point, they thought that it was the school that they were going to that wasn't very good. They clearly didn't realize that it was Daniel that was the distraction. But anyway, Suzanne goes to this other university and she settles in fine. But there was one particular person that her classmates kept noticing turning up. And of course, that was Daniel. Daniel would always, and I mean always turn up at the university. But he didn't go there, but he would turn up and he would sit in the classes, he would go on the school trips, he would go on the university trips to the law courts. And I actually had to do that. I had to go to a crown court to like sit in trials. But I couldn't imagine bringing my boyfriend along to all of that. Like I couldn't, you don't do that. The two of them were inseparable, which it's not really that unusual. I mean, it's their first love, it's their first like boyfriend, girlfriend, they're obsessed with each other. It's not that unusual, but they were really dependent on one another. It did get to a point where it wasn't healthy. Suzanne even skipped like her graduation party just to be with Daniel. Daniel would blow off work. He would never go to his job as a model airplane instructor. Suzanne even covered all of her bedroom walls with photos of Daniel. So that would be the last face she would see when she would fall asleep. Suzanne even bought Daniel a pillow with her face on it. So that was also the last face that he saw when he went to sleep. Suzanne as well would spend all of her allowance on Daniel. Suzanne even asked for her allowance to be increased. And her parents said yes, because they just thought, well, she's at university, maybe she needs more money. But Suzanne was just asking for more allowance so she could buy Daniel more gifts. Daniel even bought Suzanne a promise ring. They were so like in love. I don't even know if they were in love. They were so dependent on one another. They were so obsessed with one another. However, this this romance, this bliss wouldn't last too much longer because Suzanne's parents, Manfred and Mauricia, soon turned against Daniel. They eventually blamed Daniel for Suzanne's grades slipping. They also started to realize how much money Suzanne was spending on Daniel and they just didn't like him. They thought that he was a low life. He wasn't good for their daughter. I wouldn't be surprised if they thought that Daniel was only in a relationship with Suzanne for the money. And trust me, my mind went there as well, but I don't know. They also didn't like Daniel's work ethic. Like he had no ambition. He never turned up to work. And because they found out that he pretty much never turned up to work, they soon figured out that he was basically just living off of Suzanne's allowance, which in translation, he was basically just living off their money. They also found out that he was a bad influence on Andreas. And this was the final straw because they were thinking, oh no, we cannot allow this to happen. He has clearly already corrupted Suzanne. We cannot let him corrupt Andreas as well. They found out that Daniel took a lot of drugs, that Suzanne was also taking drugs, that Andreas was also taking drugs. And they were just like, no, no, we're not allowing this to happen. So Manfred and Mauricia sat Suzanne down and told her that she was no longer allowed to see Daniel. And Suzanne agrees not to see Daniel anymore. So now we skip to early 2002. It has been a few months now since Suzanne has been banned from seeing Daniel. And as far as Manfred and Mauricia are concerned, Suzanne has kept to her word. Now, Suzanne is not living on university campus. She's still living at home with her parents. And this is just me assuming, but I feel like that might be because she has staff to wait on her hand and foot. But uh, maybe I'm just jumping to conclusions there. However, in the week, Suzanne would stay at her friend's house. And unbelievably, her parents bought 
that lie. It's like, how did they buy that lie? How? They have literally just banned her from seeing her boyfriend, the love of her life. And now all of a sudden, multiple times a week, she is going to stay at a friend's house. Where did they think that she was going? Well, Suzanne was either going to stay at Daniel's house or she was using her allowance to book in motels and staying with Daniel in motels. And this went on for a few months until one night in April of 2002, Mauricia phoned up Suzanne's friend's house that she was supposed to be staying at and found out that Suzanne was not staying there. And it didn't take too long to put two and two together and realize that Suzanne was with Daniel. They confronted Suzanne about this, about their suspicions, and Suzanne confirmed that she had been with Daniel and her parents were furious. They were saying the same things again, that Daniel was a low life, that he was no good for their daughter, that he had no ambition or prospect in life. He would only steer her in the wrong direction. And again, they said that she was forbidden bidden from seeing Daniel. They were really putting their foot down this time. But did this help? No, it just pushed Suzanne further away. And over the next few weeks and months, Suzanne just started to rebel. She went from this quite quiet, reserved, sweet, caring young girl to now completely out of control, cold, rebellious. She was now acting like a spoilt, entitled teenager because even though she had come from wealth, she had a lot of money, she never really threw that in any one's face. She never acted like it. Well, now she was. And Suzanne wanted revenge. Suzanne would never let her parents forget what they've done to her. Whenever Suzanne was in a room with her parents, they would always argue and Suzanne would say some very horrible things to her parents. Whenever they were supposed to take a family trip or do like a family evening, like they used to do all the time, because remember this family used to be really, really close. Suzanne would refuse to go. She'd be like, no, I don't want anything to do with you people. In fact, it even got to the point where Suzanne thought that the best way to get what she wants was to split her parents up. So Suzanne was doing everything that she could to create tension in the household, to create tension between her parents. She genuinely did want her parents to split up so they could focus on their own problems and forget about her. One day, Suzanne went into her mom and said, mom, you'll never believe this. Dad is cheating on you with another woman, which was a lie. He wasn't. However, because of what Suzanne was doing to the family, there was a lot of tension in the household and the relationship between Manfred and Mauricia was on rocky ground. And because their relationship was on rocky ground, Mauricia believed her daughter. In the end though, Mauricia did figure out that Suzanne was just lying, that it wasn't true that her husband was cheating on her. But still, it really does just show how spiteful Suzanne has become. So now we get to July of 2000 and two. Suzanne is still 18 years old and Daniel is still 21. And this is when the von Richthofen family decide to take a month long trip to Europe. But did Suzanne go on this trip? No, of course not. She refused to go on the trip. She wanted to stay behind. And why did she want to stay behind? Well, her parents were going to be gone for a month, meaning that she could basically move Daniel into her home for a month without her parents. And the two of them, Suzanne and Daniel, were absolutely loving this. They were basically just living life like they were at Daniel's house, but now they were doing it in the fancy von Richthofen house. They had complete control over the house. They were making a mess. They were throwing parties, taking drugs. Then a month later, when her parents returned and they found out what was going on, they were understandably outraged. They told Suzanne that it was their home, that she had to abide by their rules, that she wasn't going to live like this under their roof. And if she wanted to live like this, well, then she was going to have to find herself her own apartment. And what did Suzanne say in response to this? Well, okay then, buy me my own apartment then. Yes, that is exactly her response. She has now said to her parents that they need to buy her her own apartment. Like I said, she has now become a spoiled brat. And her parents were like, no, I don't think so. You need to work hard and earn your own money and buy or rent your own place. And Suzanne was outraged 
by this response. Suzanne felt like she was entitled to some money to buy her own place. And because her parents didn't give her this money, she was going to make their life hell. Pretty much all out war broke out. Suzanne started bringing Daniel over to the home all the time. Even though he wasn't allowed in the home, she wouldn't listen. Shouting matches would break out between Daniel and Susan's parents, Suzanne and her own parents. There was one time as well where Manfred literally squared up to Daniel and said that he was going to break Daniel. I think there were some occasions where physical fights between Manfred and Daniel would break out. Police had to be called on multiple occasions to break up these fights. Manfred was also threatening to send Suzanne to Europe, to a university in Europe, to fix her, to get her away from Daniel. He also threatened to cut off all her money, and we know that Suzanne really values money, so I think Manfred was really hoping that this would work, but he didn't. There was one time as well where Manfred even raised his hand to his daughter and slapped Suzanne across the face, which is not okay. No way. And whenever Suzanne was around Daniel, she would say things like, oh, if only there was a way to make my parents disappear and I could get my inheritance early and we could travel the world, we could buy our own place and live the way we want to live. And Daniel would egg her on. He would encourage these conversations. And then they both together decided that it probably was the best idea to get her parents out of the way. And this is when the absolute sinister plan started to form that ended in absolute tragedy. So in October of 2002, Suzanne and Daniel decided that they were going to murder Suzanne's parents. They didn't even think twice about it. It's like, why is that the answer? Why? However, the two of them decided that they were unlikely to be able to do this on their own. They needed help. So who did they go to? Daniel's older brother, Christian, the one that is indebted to local drug dealers. They approached him and told him that they had a job for him. And if he helped them, they would pay him a lot of money. So of course, Christian being in all of that debt, that was very appealing to him. And this is when they told Christian of the plan to murder Manfred and Mauricia. But Christian, he took a few days to think about it. It's like, why do you need to think about that? The answer should be no. But he took a few days to think about it and Christian agreed to help them. On the 31st of October, so on Halloween 2002, this is also just three days before Suzanne's birthday. And this is the night that they decided to carry out the murders. So early that evening, Suzanne, Daniel and Christian gathered together and the first thing they decided was that they needed to get Andreas out of the house. They had no intention of harming Andreas. They were also not planning on telling Andreas about their plan, so they needed him out of the way. So they lured him out of the house late at night. He went out through his bedroom window and they dropped Andreas at an all-night cyber cafe. And this was actually a place that the group did go to frequently to play video games, so this wasn't an unusual place to drop Andreas. And then the group left Andreas there alone. And following this, Suzanne, Daniel and Christian make their way to the von Richthofen household. The group arrived at the home a few minutes before 11 p.m. And in preparation, Susan had actually disabled the alarm system in her parents' home a few days prior. So the group were just able to walk up to the front door. Suzanne opened the front door and her parents were not alerted. Once inside, Suzanne crept upstairs and made her way to her parents' bedroom to check to see if they were asleep, which they were just like she expected. Suzanne then paused for a second and contemplated what she was about to do. She was literally looking at her parents, her parents that only wanted the best for her. And she was watching her parents. They were so defenseless. They were fast asleep. And Suzanne decided, yep, yeah, this is what I want to do. No regrets whatsoever. She wasn't phased at all about what was about to happen. So she went back downstairs and gave a thumbs up to Daniel and Christian. And this is when the tragedy begins. So first of all, Daniel and Christian put on medical gloves and surgical caps. They were all prepared for this. So they didn't leave any fingerprints, DNA, hair behind at the crime scene. Following this, Daniel and Christian picked up their weapons, which were two iron bars 
bars. The two of them made their way to Suzanne's parents' room. Suzanne stayed downstairs. Even though this was mostly Suzanne's plan, she decided that she actually couldn't do it herself. She was just gonna wait downstairs whilst Daniel and Christian dealt with her parents. And it was around 12, 15 a.m. that Daniel and Christian made their way into Manfred and Mauricia's bedroom. Christian made his way to Mauricia's side of the bed and Daniel made his way to Manfred's side of the bed. The two brothers looked at each other and I still just don't get this. They were standing over a defenseless sleeping couple and they're just looking at one another like yeah we're actually gonna do this and they give each other a nod and instantaneously they launch their attack they bring their weapons down on the couple striking them as hard as they could daniel quickly hit manfred multiple times in the head he received severe blunt force trauma to the head and very sadly before he could even wake up before he could even realize what was happening manfred lost his life at the same time christian started striking Mauricia in the head multiple times. But unlike Manfred, Mauricia didn't lose her life instantly. Instead, she woke up and started fighting back. Mauricia put her arms out in front of her to defend herself and she received several defensive wounds trying to fight off her attackers. Desperately trying to figure out what to do, Daniel and Christian just started hitting Mauricia over and over and over again until eventually Mauricia lost consciousness. However, the two brothers soon realized that they still had a problem. Mauricia still was not dead. There was a strange gurgling noise coming from her throat and the brothers went into a panic. Daniel ran into the bathroom and grabbed two towels. He soaked them in water and ran back to the bedroom and placed a towel over Manfred and Mauricia's face trying to drown out the sound, clearly as well trying to smother Mauricia, but it didn't work. Next, Daniel shouted down to Suzanne to bring up a jug of water. So Suzanne entered the room with a jug of water in her hand and Daniel took the jug and then he poured the water over Mauricia's head and she still has that towel over her face. So essentially Daniel is now waterboarding Mauricia. The water is going through the towel and Mauricia is essentially drowning. And Suzanne just stood there so cold watching her mother literally drowning. She could have at any point said, stop, stop. I don't want this to happen anymore. And then maybe her mom could have lived. Maybe one life could have been saved. But no, Suzanne just stood there. And then finally, everything went silent. The gurgling sound had stopped. And tragically, this is when Mauricia also lost her life. Which, oh my God, that was absolutely horrific thinking about what Mauricia went through in those final moments and whilst her daughter was just literally stood there watching. So following the extremely brutal murders, the three of them went downstairs. Christian, the older brother, was so traumatized he actually broke down crying. But was Suzanne crying? No. In fact, Suzanne was the most calm out of all three of them. She actually went to calm down Christian. And now the next part of their plan is to make this murder look like a robbery gone wrong. So the three of them, I think it was just mainly Suzanne and Daniel though, basically started to trash the place. They went around and they opened drawers and threw papers everywhere. Suzanne stole some of her parents' jewelry, as well as taking $10,000 in cash or the equivalent of $10,000 in cash. And it was some of this $10,000 that they used to pay Christian for his part in the murder. Following this, the three of them left the house, disposed of their weapons. They dropped Christian off at McDonald's. Susan and Daniel checked into a luxury motel, but they actually checked into the motel as their alibi. So they made sure that people at the motel saw them. So they were out and about. They went and did a little swim in the pool. Then Suzanne and Daniel left the motel to pick up Andreas. He has been at that cyber cafe for four hours whilst his sister is murdering his parents. He is only 14. So they pick up Andreas and the three of them return to the von Richthofen family home. And I can't believe this, but Suzanne and Daniel let Andreas 
find the dead bodies of his parents. Why did she allow him to do that? How traumatizing would that have been for Andreas? And after Andreas made that discovery, I can't even imagine what that would have felt like to him. Suzanne and Daniel had to act all surprised and traumatized and heartbroken and, you know, put on the tears. It is so sick. And it was around 4 a.m. that Daniel phoned the police to report a robbery. And when the police arrived, Suzanne is seen leaving the home, pretending to be all traumatized. And at this point, no one suspect Suzanne. So Andreas and Suzanne are questioned by the police and Andreas is so devastated. I really do feel so much for him right now. However, Suzanne is completely unfazed. The police actually notice that she's acting very cold. However, the investigation gets underway and there are suspicious things at the crime scene. First of all, the alarm system had been disabled, meaning that someone knew the code, which would mean that the person that broke in was possibly family or somebody close to the family. Also, the robbery gone wrong, it was pretty obvious to police that the robbery part had been staged. There was still so many valuables left in the house. And if this really was a robbery that was willing to murder the occupants to get what they want, why would they leave behind valuables? They also found it suspicious that they found a towel over the heads of Manfred and Mauricia. When you hide someone's face like that during a murder, it kind of does mean guilt or that you know the person and you want to dissociate from what is going on. And given all of these suspicious things in the crime scene, the police then started to look at the very suspicious behavior of Suzanne. The day after the murders, Suzanne was seen having fun in the family swimming pool as if nothing had happened. She was also seen celebrating her birthday a few days after the murder. And it's like, okay, I get it's your birthday, but your parents have just been murdered. If you were innocent, you wouldn't really feel like celebrating your birthday, would you? But then probably the most suspicious thing is that Suzanne kept asking about her inheritance money. She kept asking, when will I be able to sell the house? I need money, I need cash now. And then when it came to the funeral, a lot of people noticed that Suzanne's outfit wasn't exactly appropriate. But a lot of people took offense to the fact that Suzanne was wearing a crop top to a funeral, which it is kind of inappropriate, isn't it? And especially given what she has done, it's like, why are you making it so obvious that you just don't care about your parents? So with everything added together, the police were definitely keeping a close eye on Suzanne. And they were just really hoping that if she was guilty, that she would slip up. And in the end, somebody did slip up, but it wasn't Suzanne. It was actually Christian. So a few days after the murder, using the cash that he was paid, Christian bought a very expensive motorbike. And I'm not 100% sure how the police even found out this, but they did and they found it highly suspicious and they brought Christian in for questioning. They were asking him where he got the cash from. They were really putting pressure on him and Christian finally cracked. He couldn't take the pressure and he told the police everything. And not too long after this, Christian, Daniel, and Suzanne were all arrested and charged with the murders of Manfred and Mauricia. Following the arrest, Suzanne was actually released. And given we are in Brazil, I think this is actually pretty common in the Brazilian criminal justice system. Now, following the arrest, as you can imagine, this case blew up in the media. It became this huge scandal and it is one of the most infamous cases from Brazil. People just couldn't get over that this young, clean cut girl that had her whole life ahead of her, that had so much money, had so many opportunities, would turn on her parents and murder them. And given that Daniel was from a poor background, a lot of people seem to come to the conclusion that it was Daniel. It was all Daniel. Suzanne, she was just an innocent girl. She was just taken under Daniel's spell. People didn't really think that Suzanne was the mastermind. 
at first. So Suzanne was just out there doing whatever she wanted and it would take four years for her case to finally go to trial, which is crazy when you think about it, that for four years, she was just out and about doing whatever she wanted. And what's even crazier is during those four years, she had access to her inheritance. Mm, no, I'm sorry, no. So the trial is about to start and Suzanne, to prepare for the trial, she decides to give some TV interviews. She tried to paint herself as this perfect image that she felt sorry for what she had done. She felt remorse. She was led astray. She said that she had nothing but hatred for Daniel. It was all him. However, <laughs> This makes me so happy, it really does. I love it when liars get exposed because during one of her interviews, her mic was actually on before the recording. And before the interview, the mic picked up her attorney coaching her on what she should say. Her attorney even told her to cry on camera to get the sympathy of the public. Muita droga, eu cada vez era mais e mais e mais droga e ele me dava mais droga. Her attorney was saying things like, yes, make this story up, make that story up. Her attorney was actually encouraging her to lie. And when the public heard this recording, they were outraged. Because prior to this recording, they believed her sob story. They thought that she was the innocent one. But after the recording, everyone turned on Suzanne. And then on the 17th of July, 2006, the trial finally began. And to nobody's surprise, Suzanne and Daniel turned on one another. Yes, their unbreakable teenage love was no more. Daniel said that Suzanne was the mastermind behind the whole plan. She had dragged him into her plan. She had made him do her dirty work. And Daniel also said that his brother Christian had nothing to do with the murders. Daniel said that he committed the murders alone, which is obviously not true, but it was just a desperate attempt to get his brother out of the situation situation that he dragged him into. And then it was Suzanne's turn to take the stand. And she did the exact same thing. She pointed her finger at Daniel. She took no responsibility. She was actually really cold on the stand. And she said that Daniel was a bad influence. He had dragged her down the dark path. Daniel was the one that wanted to get his hands on the money. But in the end, the jury saw straight through all three of them. They thought that all three of them were equally guilty for the murder which meant that Christian, Daniel and Suzanne were all found guilty of murder. Suzanne and Daniel were sentenced to 40 years in prison and Christian was sentenced to 38 years in prison. However, does the story end there? Of course it doesn't because as soon as Suzanne was in prison, she continued to make headlines. At first, she was actually placed in solitary confinement for a while because she had become such a notorious inmate after her trial. Like this trial, trial, this case was headline news in Brazil. Then she made more headlines because apparently, and I must stress apparently, she had seduced a doctor and an attorney to help her appeal her case and shorten her sentence. And then in 2014, at the age of 30, Suzanne entered into a relationship with another female inmate, a woman known as Sandra Bleed, which is um, not her real name, obviously. And Sandra Bleed was convicted of murdering her 14-year-old neighbor, so that is a really lovely person. And the two of them started dating behind bars and they eventually got married and then divorced. Suzanne then got married again to a man and I don't really know any more details than that, but she got married in 2017 and then got divorced again in 2020. And finally, whilst Suzanne was in prison, she was allowed out of prison on many occasions for what were known as vacations. You are actually hearing this right. Suzanne was allowed out on vacation. I thought this was prison. She was also allowed out on holidays such as Mother's Day and Father's Day. And I assume she was probably let out on some of the other holidays as well. But apparently that is actually quite common in Brazil. And Suzanne was actually seen out of prison on these days. She was photographed by paparazzi. And when Suzanne was out of prison on one of these vacations, she was seen partying. It's ridiculous. And quite rightly so, the public were outraged because it's like, she's supposed to be in prison. Suzanne then gave an interview behind bars to Brazilian media 
media saying that she is a different person, that she is turning her life around, she is getting a degree and she wants to become a mother and start a family. And also whilst behind bars, Suzanne underwent a personality test and the results of the test, I have them here, quote, elevated ego, childlike conduct, a narcissistic and manipulative personality and camouflaged aggressiveness. So yeah, she is a manipulative narcissist. And then to give an update on the other two that were involved in the murders, in 2017, 15 years after the murders, Christian was released from prison. He went on to have a child and start a family. And then a year later, Daniel was also released from prison. He went on to marry and start a family as well. And then finally, I can't believe I'm about to say this. This is going to shock you all. On the 11th of January, 2023, Suzanne von Richthofen was released from prison. Yep, yep, Suzanne is out there and she's been walking around doing whatever she wants for four months. And then a month after her release in February, she sparked public outrage once again because she started her own Instagram account, gained thousands of followers, and then used that to open up her own business selling homemade clothes. This is not an endorsement. No, do not buy anything. Mm, do not recommend at all. But I had to tell you about it, didn't I? Because it's absolutely ridiculous. She has her own e-commerce website. She has a business. It's ridiculous. And then there is one more person that we need to talk about, and that is Andreas. Because, oh my God, I feel so much for him. Because after the murders, he was absolutely distraught. After the murders, he went to live with extended family. He struggled with how to react to Suzanne. That's his sister, but then his sister has also murdered their parents. He didn't really know how to react. So when she first went to prison, he did start to visit her to try and understand what she had done. But in the end, he completely cut her off. Andreas buried himself in his studies. He did earn a PhD in chemistry from the University of Sao Paulo, which is honestly incredible. And I know his parents would be proud of him. However, there have been a lot of struggles in Andreas's life. At one point in his older life, he was photographed in a drug-induced state when he was arrested by police. I don't really know what that was all about, but I think we can all understand that he probably suffers a lot and he has received treatment for his mental health. And then in 2011, Andreas sued his sister for her half of the inheritance, which thankfully he won, which means means that Suzanne will not get a single penny of that inheritance. All of the money will go to Andreas and I am so happy about that because Suzanne, she does not deserve a penny. However, still sadly, um, Suzanne will get some money because remember Manfred had offshore accounts that had up to $10 million in them. Well, in Manfred's will, it stated that those offshore accounts, that money should go directly to Suzanne and it has so... <laughs> Suzanne is a multimillionaire. It's like, really, what the hell? She got what she wanted in the end. She got that money. I'm sorry, but that just makes me so angry. I am so angry in this case. And that is actually why I wanted to cover this case because I knew she had been released from prison. And going back to the intro where I said, was Suzanne the mastermind or was Daniel the mastermind? I think it's very clear that it was Suzanne. Not that I'm saying Daniel is innocent or Christian. Uh-uh, no, they were all guilty. Daniel was definitely a bad influence on her. He definitely led her down the wrong path. But ultimately, when it came to the murder, it was Suzanne. It was all Suzanne. And she made Daniel and Christian do her dirty work. And I just hope that Andreas is doing okay, because that's who I care about. And finally, we need to end this video focusing on the victims of today's case. Manfred and Mauricia von Richthofen were described as kind, friendly, and a caring couple. They met back in university. They fell in love 
and they went on to build their lives together. Manfred worked hard as an engineer and Mauricio worked hard as a psychiatrist. Both of them just wanted the best for their family. They both loved their children, Andreas and Suzanne, so much. They were only 49 and 50 years old. And that brings us to the end of today's case on Suzanne von Richthofen. So you guys are going to have to let me know your thoughts, theories and opinions on today's case. And also don't forget to leave me your case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next. And thank you again to Home Design Makeover for sponsoring today's video. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.